Back in Bible days, God would punish the wicked and he would save the righteous. This is seen in Noah's day. This is seen in Lot's day. But for some reason, when you look in the New Testament, God wants to punish the righteous and save the wicked. This is the day when the truth is considered a lie and the lie is considered a truth. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 17, 15, he that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Verse 26, also to punish the just is not good, nor to strike princes for equity. All these beliefs that are in the New Testament of God punishing the righteous to save the wicked go against the entire Bible. We are getting back into the word and we are still talking about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a very important piece to the puzzle, especially as pertaining to Bible prophecy. There's so much involved with the mess of Benjamin. Benjamin's mess was five times over. All right. People fail to realize what the Apostle Paul did was very evil. He stole a man and made merchandise of him. Now, we want to get back to what we was talking about with John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul. We went over many things they had in common, okay? Now, we want to talk about one of the most important things they had in common. This is going to be John chapter 1, verse 29. This is the book of John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John see Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. All right, so that was the first person who ever mentioned anything like that. It came from John. I told you yesterday, these two spirits have been in the world. All right, you got the spirit of Saul and you got the spirit of David. It was in the beginning, okay? As a matter of fact, I want to go to that story real quick. It's not in my notes, but that story is seen in the book of Genesis chapter 4. I want someone to get that because I need to go to something else real quick. And I want to go right to the part where God rejected Cain's sacrifice. This is going to be verse 2. This is the book of Genesis chapter 4 verse 2. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. All right, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. In other words, here we have David, here we have Saul. David was over the sheep, okay? And we went into the types and shadows and how we talk about the house of David and we talk about the house of Saul and how we talk about Islam being David and we talk about Saul being Christianity. From the beginning, Abel was over the sheep. And this is the spirit of David in the land. All right. But Cain, he was a tiller of the ground. That is Christianity. And I'm going to prove that to you. I want you to read verse 3 real quick. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. All right, so that fruit of the ground, okay, I'm going to show you. 
that fruit of the ground is going into Jesus resurrected. All right, the Apostle Paul taught more on Jesus being resurrected more than any other disciple or apostle. All right, first, I want you to get 1 Corinthians 15, 20. This is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. All right, so the first fruit is going into the resurrection, okay? The apostle Paul taught that Jesus Christ was the first person to be resurrected, and that is from the ground, okay? I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. All right, so that is proof when he talk about first fruits, he's talking about Christ being the first person to ever resurrect. All right. Now, I want to give you another scripture where Paul is constantly using this term first fruit. Now, this term is also used in the Old Testament, but it's talking about the first fruit of your crops, okay, agriculture, things like that. The Apostle Paul, remember, he was a Pharisee, so he had this revelation knowledge. He had all this revelation insight, okay, and even the Edomite, okay, Agrippa told him, he said, much studying, Paul, has made you mad, has made you go crazy. All right, so I want to get another scripture. This is going to be Romans 8, 23. This is the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. All right, so the Apostle Paul again is mentioning first fruit. Now, Jesus never, ever mentioned the word first fruit. And the word first fruit has never been mentioned as a resurrection in the entire Bible. All right. Paul comes up with this first. It seems to me like Paul is the teacher of Jesus. It seems to me like Paul is the rabbi. He is the father of Christianity because the things Jesus talked about for the most part was simple. But the Apostle Paul, he is the one who has gotten real deep. And he's going into the resurrection being first fruit. I'm going to show you another one. This is going to be Romans 11, 16. This is the book of Romans chapter 11, verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. All right, so here he is again using this term first fruits. The Apostle Paul used that referring to the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Now, let's get back to where we was at in the book of Genesis. This was the offering that came, okay, brought to the Most High. It was the fruit of the ground. Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus rose from the grave. So let's get that. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 3. And in process of time it came to pass, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. All right, so God did not respect what Cain brought, okay? He had no respect, and to this day he has no regard for that message, I know nothing among you save Jesus Christ crucified. All right? We got to give honor and respect where respect is due. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, he gave us the revelation that Jesus Christ was not killed or crucified. Now, let's get into Cain's offering. Let's read verse 4 again. And Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. Alright, he took that little lamb, and 
then he slaughtered it. All right. He killed the best. Okay. Think about it. God is over all things competent. Okay. He is the most high God. And right now, Jesus is being worshipped as God all over the planet. Christians will tell you Jesus loves you before they even say God bless you. All right. Now, we don't speak in son terms, but I like to speak in this way because this is how people get it in the terms of family. The Bible tells us to honor the father and the mother. We are not supposed to be honoring the son above the father. Just like Eli, God came and corrected him because he did not restrain his sons. And God told Eli that he was honoring his sons above himself, speaking of the father. So here you have Abel. From the beginning, he took that lamb and he killed it. All right. He took the best one, the first one, and he killed it. That's honorable. That's honorable. That is very honorable when we look at today and how many people are worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping man. Okay. They're worshiping Paul. They're worshiping all these things besides the one true God. All right. And keep in mind, this was just a firstling of his flock. All right. And the Lord had respect unto his offering. So that shows you right here in the very beginning that this war in between the house of Saul and the house of David was already at work and that's why if we was to keep going if we was to keep reading you'll find out let's go to verse 8 and Cain talked with Abel his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him all right so he killed him why read verse 5 but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. He was very mad. Remember, okay, Cain actually means spear, and Abel actually means spirit. Now think about King Saul when he took his spear and he tried to kill David. Why did he kill his brother? It was out of jealousy. He was so jealous at the response that Abel got rather than the response that he got from God. Okay, so he was very mad. And that same spirit, you see it, okay? Even when they supposedly tried to deliver Jesus, okay, to be crucified, it was all out of jealousy. It was all out of jealousy. So he killed his brother, out of pure jealousy. And that's that same spirit that was at work. In the days of David. When Saul was trying to kill David. Okay. Remember the woman. They sung a song. They said Saul has slain his thousands. But David is tens of thousands. And he got very, very jealous. Let's get that scripture real quick. This is going to be 1 Samuel 18, 8. Let's start at verse 7. This is the book of 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David his tens of thousands. The women were ecstatic, man. They were singing like David got it. David has killed ten thousands. David is the champion. David is the warrior. Let me tell you something. The relationship laws in the house of David is far much better than the relationship laws with King Saul. Think about King Saul. 
He comes from Benjamin. Benjamin, when he was born, his name was Benoni because he killed his mama. Why would the women be singing about Saul? Okay? The nation of Benjamin was actually under oath, okay? And none of the children of Israel wanted to give their daughters to Benjamin. Nobody wanted to give their daughters to Benjamin. And they made a promise. This was the time when Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, was knocking on the door to sleep with a man, just like in the days of Lot. And our people, they were so far from gay, all right? They were so far from gay that they literally took their daughter. Okay, look, huh? Y'all asking for these men, huh? Here's a woman, have fun. This is the natural way, all right? And so they gave Benjamin a concubine, all right? And the nation of Benjamin abused this woman all night long, all right? And so the day sprang the next day and they let her go. And the man took his concubine, cut it up in 12 pieces and sent it throughout the coast of Israel. And there was huge, huge animosity fueled. And there was a deep hatred for Benjamin after they did this act. Okay. And they literally went to war starting with the nation of Judah against Benjamin to the point that they literally wiped out completely almost all of Benjamin. All right? And every time Judah would come to the Lord and ask him, should I go against my brother? The Lord said, go. The Lord ordained war against Benjamin because Benjamin was so wicked. So when we think about the nation of Saul and the teachings of Paul and how he treats his woman, shut up, go cook chicken, all right? Don't get married, stay single. That's the teachings coming from Christianity. That's the teachings coming from the house of Saul. You Israelite camps are so off, okay? But the house of David, it has more liberty for the woman, more respect for the woman so these women are singing not only because of that but because David was a greater warrior than that of Saul so now we want to read verse 8 and Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him and he said they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands and what can he have more but the kingdom? All right. When I was growing up, I had teachers that when they would read something, they would put passion in it. They would be sarcastic a little bit. So in verse 8, I'm going to read the last part with a little passion and sarcasm. And what can he have more but the kingdom? That's his feelings right there. That's how he felt. He was being a big wimp. He was being a big crybaby. He knew deep down that the kingdom was going to go eventually from the nation of Israel to a heathen Gentile nation, just like Jesus spoke of in Matthew 21, 43, that these Israelite camps got a million breakdowns for, and none of them is right because they jealous. They jealous at the fact that God rose up someone that is better than you. All right, so now getting back to where we was at with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first person to ever mention, behold the Lamb of God which take away the sins of the world. Now let's get that scripture in the book of John. 136. This is the book of John, chapter 1, verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. 
and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. All right, that's all I need. That right there, what he said, is what got his head. That's what got his head, all right? I was always in suspense about the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a picture of the Apostle Paul, okay? He just played his role. That's all he did. He just played the role. If you examine the life of John the Baptist, he did not follow Jesus. He said great swelling words about Jesus, but he never followed him. And when he was put in prison because he was worried about Herod and who he married, all right, he sent disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one or should we look to another? All right. So that ought to open up your mind right there. Okay, that ought to open up your mind. Now we want to go to your boy Paul. Now Paul preached Christ crucified more than any other apostle. I want you to get 1 Corinthians one twenty three. This is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. All right, so there you have it. Paul preached Christ crucified. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, he got more bold about it. I want you to get that. This is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. All I want to know is Christ crucified. Man, he had that tent peg, that cross. And he was drilling it in the minds of the people. All right. The Apostle Paul was damaging people's minds with that tent peg. Now think about a tent peg. All right. Jail used the tent peg on a man's head. That causes work coming from your hand predominantly your right hand in a person's head, all right? And think about it. I'm not putting it out there or anything, but just think about it. The Bible talks about the mark of the beast. And the Bible talks about having a mark in your forehead or in your right hand. <laughs> This is the book of Genesis 35 and verse 18. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Now, Benoni means son of my pain, son of sorrow. Benjamin, when he was born, he killed his mama. And speaking of Mark of the Beast, do you not know that Benjamin means son of my right hand? Wow. Are you the person who is preaching Christ crucified? Okay, that would be the person with the mark on his right hand if we was to go that way. Or to think about the person who just simply believes it. Okay, or been murdered by it. That would be the person going into the head. Also, I want to show you some major connections with Paul and the word Mark. First off, I want you to get Genesis 4.15. And before we get 4.15, I want to go back to that story in Genesis 4. All right. And I want you to read verse 9. This is the book of Genesis chapter 4, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? All right, that's what he said. He lied about the death of his brother. That was the same spirit present in the days of Jesus. They lied about his death. Okay? Now let's go to verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, 
lest any finding him should kill him. All right, so the Lord put a mark on Cain. Hmm. All right. Now I want you to go to Romans 16, and I'm going to show you something. When you type in the word mark, I'm going to show you. The apostle Paul used it more than anybody. He used it more than anybody in the entire Bible. Okay, I want somebody to get Romans 16, 17. This is the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. All right, I'm marking you. Let's go to Galatians 6, 17. It's on the screen. Let's go. This is the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Okay, that was what he said. All right. We don't associate partners with God or we don't take Lord's in addition to God. All right. But this is what your boy Paul said. Let's go to Philippians 3.14. This is the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There you go, Paul. There your boy Paul go. All right. He said, I press towards the mark of the prize for the high calling in Christ Jesus. All right. A famous scripture amongst Christians. I, I wonder what that's going into. Now let's go to... Philippians 3, 17. This is the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. All right, so he's saying mark them that walk, okay, as an example, okay? Now let's go to 2 Timothy 4, 11. This is the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. All right, take Mark, okay? The same guy that he was disputing with, all right, in the book of Acts, all right, when him and Barnabas split up because of the contention was so thick when he failed to forgive Mark, now he's saying, bring Mark. He's, he's profitable for me, for me. All right. Now I want you to get Revelations 13, 16. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Or in their foreheads. Okay. One of the two places. Okay. All right. Are you in the ministry? Or are you receiving ministry? That is deep right there. But we are going to go on, okay? This is just going to be brought up because I was thinking about this as I was studying this topic, all right, about the man um, that got hit in the head with the millstone, Abimelech. And I've been studying on the millstone, and we're going to come back to that. But... I want to get Deuteronomy 24 and 1, okay, because I always like to go back to this topic, speaking of the kingdom. This is going to be Deuteronomy 24 and 1. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it came to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand. And send her out of his house. All right. So this is going into what Jesus was talking about. Now, Jesus talked about marriage because they asked him questions. And that's when he was talking about fornication. OK, he said, except there be fornication. All right. Don't just be divorcing your woman for nothing. This uncleanness. OK, is going into something. OK, so he's like, all right, you could divorce her if you find some uncleanness in her. All right. Give her a bill of divorcement and send her out of his house. Just like God did the nation of Israel, okay? He sent them out of Jerusalem. He cast them out. Just like Jesus was casting out devils, casting out devils, the last devil Israel was cast out. 
and 70 CE. Now let's keep going. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. All right. Now she may go, okay, and join another religion, okay? This is metaphorically how I'm speaking it. Now let's keep going. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, keep going, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. All right, she is defiled. Now, just think about Israel, okay? Israel being the chosen nation, okay? They committed adultery, all right? Spiritual fornication against the Most High. So the Most High cast them out, okay? So now think about God's laws on marriage. A woman cannot go back to her former husband. <laughs> she can't go back to him. She can go find another husband, okay? But she can't go back to that same husband. Keep going. For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. All right, so that would be an abomination for a woman, okay, to go back to that same husband. That's why in the Gospels, Jesus said the kingdom shall be taken from you and given to another nation. Now, you can be a part of that religion, okay? You can be up under that religion that this Gentile messenger has, but you can't come back to Israel. That's an abomination. There was no reason for him to make a new covenant if you are welcomed back the same way on those same terms. That's just something for you to think upon. Now we are done. All right. We're going to get back into the scriptures, but I have a word for you. Let me tell you something. The apostle Paul is the lion king, lion. He's lion. Okay. Not a, like a lion, not like a lion, lying. Okay. Telling falsehood. He's the lion king. Okay. He is the founder of Christianity. He is the Jesus of the Christian church. All right. He lied about the death of Jesus Christ, just like Scar lied about the death of Simba's father, Mufasa. OK, this is elementary stuff for you guys. OK, you got to deal with real prophecy. Y'all talk about, oh, yeah, the Quran ain't got no prophecy and all this stuff. Let me tell you something. Truth is prophecy. If you in a book and they lying, that's not prophecy. That's prophet lying. OK, so I encourage you to study the scriptures and you'll see God is a God of his word and what he says he will do. He said he took the kingdom from Israel. He didn't say I'm giving the kingdom to Israel. Now it's time for us to get any scripts. Shout. We, we shall. shall.